thank you all for joining us for you know this kickoff of the FMEA podcast. I'm Majori Spencer. I'm the chair of the Professional Learning Committee, and I'm joined with Bridget Polson, who is our Performing Arts Coordinator in Pinellas County Schools, and also Megan Alfaro, who is F-E-M-E-A President-Elect. So thank y'all for being here. Very welcome. Thanks, Thanks for, having for having us. us. So as y'all know, the conference theme this year is Music Education Begins with me, M-E. And so when I was thinking a lot about this theme, I thought a little bit more about a topic that's near and dear to me, which is joy, of course. And we'll be talking a lot on the podcast over the next few months about the idea of joy, finding it, creating it, whatever the case may be. And while I was sort of pondering that, I came across you all session entitled To Not The Noise, and I thought it would be the perfect sort of prelude to the conference and also kick off to this series. So welcome. Um, I'll give you all a second just in starting to talk a little bit about your sort of music ed journey as teachers um, from the very beginning beginnings and then up until where you are now. So Megan, you want to go first? Sure. Uh, yes, I started teaching in 2001 in Pinellas County in San Jose Elementary in Dunedin. It was a Title I school, small neighborhood school. I really enjoyed my time there, um, but it was about 50 minutes from my house. So I moved to a school much closer to my house, Lakewood Elementary, when I was in, in about 2005. So uh, that really began my journey as a, a teacher because um, it's a Title one school, high, very high poverty school, and it really gave me the skills that I needed to develop to become an effective teacher in any sort of environment. So I was really excited um, for my time there. Uh, and then I moved to Northwest Elementary in 2012 when my daughter started kindergarten. And so I was there running. I did um, chorus. We did drumming. We had a modern band group. And so I really loved working at the the school because it had such a community feel. Teachers would stay there for decades, literally spend their entire careers at Northwest Elementary School. It was also a Title I school, but as I said, a different level of Title I. Um, and so then after my son finished the fifth grade, I saw that this staff developer position came open, and so I decided to apply. And to my excitement, I was selected for the position. So this is now my third year as the K-12 Performing Arts Staff Developer. Nice, nice. Bridget, how about you? I know you've been in some states. I've been in some states. Um, I started my journey in 2006 in Orlando um, at University High School. I thought I was going to start and end my career there. That was my plan. And then as life often does, it just... Uh, I got upended. I moved to D.C. area where um, instead of teaching choir, which is what I had been used to up to that point, um, I was teaching general music 6 through 12 on a 6 through 12 campus in D.C. Uh, very different, um, obviously, than what I had been used to. Um, that also was a ridiculously long commute for me because I lived in Maryland at the time. And I um, then moved to Maryland or uh, moved to a Maryland school. Um, it was a sixth or eighth campus, so middle school campus, um, teaching orchestra, guitar, and choir. So a little bit back to my choir roots there. Um, I learned a ton about teaching middle school and what that entails and also growing a program. That program had been kind of idle for about 40 years. Um, and we, let's see, my, my team and I, we grew from um, one and a half positions units um, to all the way to three full-time music teachers at that um, at that time, which was awesome. Um, then I moved back to high school, going at Gaithersburg um, High School, and again growing a program there. So I kind of found a, a niche for myself. And then, as luck would have it, moved back down to Florida, got to work in Pinellas County Schools at Northeast High School. Um, and once again, got a chance to build another program there. Um, and I, I kind of found my, my niche there, which was the growing the program building and um, establishing that articulation and recruitment structure. Um, and then this job came open at the same time um, that Megan's job came open. And it was a, a brand new position where I would get to do more of that, except work on a broader scale. So very excited. Nice. So... Um, we'll talk a little bit about your session and sort of what inspired you. But in both of your stories, what I hear is a, is a lot of flexibility. And so I'm <laughs> sure that might be a theme um, as we talk. You know, I hear you talk about, you know, two different Title I schools, but still 
different and sort of having to navigate those differences. And then probably for you, a lot of unexpected classes. Yes. Um, and figuring out, again, how to tune out that noise, which we'll talk about, and sort of have success for you and for your students. So um, what inspired you all to create the, the session? And also, like, what what is the noise? What is that? Yes, the so noise. Much noise. There, yes, there's lots of noise. So we have, as educators, we're faced with a lot of multi-directional noise. So we have noise coming from just our school site. What is it that we're supposed to be doing? How is it that we fit or sometimes don't fit into the school vision? Mm -hmm. And how can we make ourselves fit into the school vision? And then also, how do we deal with the noise coming from state mandates? And you know, in our p particular climate right now, it's particularly challenging um, so it helps to have these different um, these different ways that you can monitor the noise figure out what's important and then figure out what you can toss aside and, and move towards a positive um, environment for also yourself. Also not forgetting the internal noise. I know that's something that for both Megan and I we have we have had a lot of struggle with um, and trying to navigate um, perfectionism and um, an idyllic program that you want versus all of these kind of negative reactions that we have to things as well. So there's also our own internal noise aside from the pressures that are coming from yes. outside. <laughs> Gotcha. So with those pressures and like you mentioned, internal things, um, I would still consider both of you really positive people. So with that in mind, for each of you, what's step one? You know, the noise is happening. The pressure is happening. How do you how do you start? Yeah, in our presentation, we discussed... Um, Subtle plug. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which you would learn much more about when you come to it. Um, we discussed determining your why. What is it that drove you to the profession in the first place? And always keeping that at the forefront of what you're doing. And when you're presented with these challenges, keeping that why in your mind as a way to continue to have the motivation to go. I know that for me, I've always been more successful when I had determined my own vision. So again, your why, but putting it into a concrete form, your, your mission or your vision for that school, for yourself, for that program, um, and being having that specificity will help along with mm -hmm. that, that why. That's great. Um, and, and I think even personally, I have, I go back to that every once in a while where I'm like, okay, things are getting hectic. <laughs> what's, what's the it here? Like what am I actually working toward? So sort of flipping that from professional to personal, you know, we have a lot of teachers who will talk about, you know, trying to find that balance um, in between professional and personal life. We can also have a lot of noise on that <laughs> side of things. So I guess I'll ask that exact same question in terms of first step. But, you know, what does that look like on the personal end? And I know both of you are moms. Um, so so is, it, is it the same? Is it still determining your why? Is it a little different when you're trying to find clarity on the personal end? That's a very interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, on the personal end, I, Bridget and I were discussing this as we were planning for the session. Uh, I think everyone has a different level of comfort as yes. to what the balance is between mm -hmm. personal and professional life. And so for some people like myself that I, I really enjoy and thrive in the work environment. And so for me, I like to have uh, kind of an equal mm -hmm. between my personal and my professional life. But I know for some people, it might not look the same. And so part of that is determining what does that look like for you personally, and then accepting that, not yeah. giving, like feeling the pressure that you have to be or conform to whatever it is that you think it's supposed but to But also be. understanding, in, if you're trying to create two equal things, having that equal work-life I mean, it's, I'm not going to say balance because at that point we're just trying to make it equal. Understanding that something at some point is going to give. Um, either if you're starting at a, a school that really needs a lot of work and needs um, building, then you're going to have to also recognize that, well, maybe it won't go as fast as quickly as I want it to go. You know, um, for me, I'm kind of on the other end. I don't like things <laughs> being equal like that because I know there are times for me where it ebbs and flows. There are times where I'm going to sacrifice a lot more um, for my, my professional job and then um, understanding that it will take a little bit of a personal consequence and then vice versa. There will be times when I figure out you know, this has to give a little bit so that I can really focus at home. And it's figuring out which which type of person you are and then giving yourself a lot of grace and forgiveness for when we mess up because we will. Yes, because we're human. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and I love what you just said there, because for both of you, 
it's the recognition that it's not the same for everybody. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think as veteran teachers, we'll give advice to newer teachers and forget to sort of add that caveat in. You know, like I often hear um, the advice, don't take work home, never. And it's the absolute words, it's the never <laughs> take work home. And like, I, I can think back to, you know, my first year teaching and I, you know, and I was probably very much out of balance with how much I worked at home, but I also know myself as a person and a teacher. And there were times where I would be, I would feel more comfortable in the classroom on Monday mm -hmm. if I spent those 15 minutes of my personal time, just getting myself together yeah. versus that sort of absolute rule of I'm not going to do anything at home and then being miserable through all of Monday. But that's me. I think that's it, though. Hard and fast rules don't really apply here. And if we're trying to stick to those hard and fast, they can be guidelines, sure. But if we're trying to make it hard and fast, then it's automatically creating disaster in our lives down the, down the line. And it's hard to envision yourself in a career, you know, 10 years from now, what this will look like. So if you mm -hmm. are a beginning teacher, I, I share with people that I used to spend hours on a Sunday prepping my lesson plans. <laughs> and then after I had been teaching for 15 years, I could get it done in a half an hour on a Thursday. So it's just uh, knowing that that is going to change and look different over the course of your career and accepting that whatever it is that you need to be a successful as a teacher and happy as in your personal life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that requires a, a level of introspection and just checking in with yourself yes. to say like, how am I feeling? Do I think the systems around me are allowing me to feel the way that I want to feel? An excessive amount of self-awareness. <laughs> <laughs> um, switching topics just a hair, you know, another hot button sort of word or topic is the idea of toxic positivity. Ooh. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, I do think it's important to have, you know, we've been talking about balance, uh, a bit of balance between sort of optimism and realism. But for each of you, sort of how how do you find that balance mm -hmm. um, when you're saying, hey, I got to, you know, I got to tune things out. I got to make sure I'm finding my why. And maybe there are some things around me that aren't the way I want them to be. Um, yeah, that's a, a it's, it's a great question, and I often I, I tend to be a very positive person. Um, I just I, I don't know where maybe that came from my parents. I'm not sure, but um, I am also aware of how things work and the details involved in things. And so I have a very clear vision of what I want my classroom to look like, mm -hmm. what I want my app, my product to be for my students, what I want out of um, the program at my school. So I have that very clear vision. And so I'm able, because I have that vision, I'm able to structure the things around it. So if something is not going well, going back to my why, I know that I want to have this at the highest quality that I can. So by incorporating um, strategies to help with that, I can, uh, you know, accept that, yes, there are some things that are not good. Mm -hmm. And because I have a positive outlook, I can work towards building what my vision for the program or my students will be. I am not a naturally positive person. So I think this is nice that we get to hear kind of both sides. Um, I am very hard on myself. Um, perfectionism r running rampant through me. Um, but for me, I think determining taking a few minutes every single day at the very end when there, there's that nice calm when the kids have gone there's like that moment before everything else happens you know before you have faculty meetings or whatever there's this brief moment um i would journal i would do a quick little journal and i would just say one thing i really loved about that day and then one goal for the next day and having something that was really tangible um every single day would really help because I, I would actually go back and look um, over the summer on some of those more challenging things and, and have that reflection. Um, but for me, I, I have to plan. I have to know what it looks like on a calendar. Um, I have to be able to see the steps, uh, incremental steps on how to, to fix a problem. And that would give me a lot more peace because it would, there's that need to do something. So even if I can't necessarily change um, Johnny in my class who is running rampant and not listening or following directions, I can't change that. But I still have to show up there for Johnny. So how can I structure the rest of my classroom to feel like I'm having more success and trying to reach him every day without necessarily let, letting him get to me and cause it to be something very negative reflecting on myself? 
Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And and uh, another piece, if any, any, I'm not a therapist, but if anyone... <laughs> we are not therapists. <laughs> no. <laughs> if anyone else has experience with therapy, um, mm-hmm. I my children have both recently been through therapy. And one of the things that they've talked a lot about is cognitive reframing. Mm-hmm. And so... You know, we mentioned earlier, Bridget, you mentioned about giving yourself grace. Um, I mean, negative emotions, if we want to call them negative, they are just that. They are, it, it, it's when we um, use it and, like, let it beat us up. If we can accept that, yes, I feel this way, and now I can take some steps with my thinking to reframe how I view this particular emotion or challenge, that that is a, a, can make you more productive and positive and satisfied in your career. And just like any kind of thought that enters our brain, it is its at, it, at its weakest or most malleable form when it first enters our brain. So if we had a bad day, and then we ruminate on it. It's going to make things a lot worse. Not saying that it has to be positive all the time, but we can change that. We can reframe whatever that thought is and make it into something actionable. And I think that for, for me, that has helped a lot instead of making it just, well, everything's going to be fine. Everything's going to be perfect. I'm going to just make sure that this, you know, I'm going to be better. It, it's more like, okay, this happened. I recognize it. Now, what do I do? And what's within my control. Too. And what is within my control. Yes, because the fastest way to make yourself crazy is to... Uh, try to control things that you absolutely cannot. I've learned that as a mother. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Motherhood's good for teaching you that. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Parenthood. Mm-hmm. So this really segues um, really well into some of our sort of closing thoughts. You know, I think everyone's pathway to joy, which again, we'll talk a lot more about over the course of the podcast is different. Mm-hmm. Um, and part of it is, you know, choosing your own mindset or reframing, having those sort of mindset shifts. Um, and you all sort of touch on this, allowing yourself room to fail and then forgiving yourself when not if but when you do Mm -hmm. um and i think as teachers we do such a great job of teaching our students that but then i think for us as teacher leaders talking to other teachers it's also reminding them to do that it's okay to try something it didn't work um and it's not you as a failure going back to that reframing but it's this thing this thing didn't work um, but that does not mean that there's still not a path for you to get to that, to your why or to get to those sort of joyous moments. So, um, sort of as we close out things, um, talk a little bit about, um, actually I'll do it this way. Um, <laughs> thinking about the noise, you know, of today and everything like that. Um, what is a message that you would deliver to your first year teacher self? Message for my first year teacher self. Yeah, given some of the things that we've talked about in terms of, you know, your why and sort of reframing, controlling the things you I feel like we're going to go back and forth on this one because I feel like I have a lot of, a lot of, I have a lot of stuff that I would tell my (laughs) my first year teacher (laughs) self. Starting, uh, I think the most important part for me is find a fast community. Find a a group of people, like minded or not, um, who you can share life and share this journey with. Um, I think it's good to have people from all different backgrounds in there. So not only other first year teachers who are naturally going to bond with, but also, um, you know, your friends who you're bringing in and veteran teachers. But I would say build that community and be very careful of who you allow into that community. Um, And, you know, being discriminant there is very important. But having that support system, building that immediately um, and not being afraid to ask questions to that community as well. I love that. Uh, the safety that you can find within your colleagues. Is, mm-hmm. And uh, also, like you said, um, being careful who is in that community. Cause I did have a, a bad experience when I went from one school to another with a teacher who did not have a positive mindset and um, basically scared me to death about my <laughs> new job. And <laughs> thankfully my husband was like, listen, you've got this. And so because of his positivity, I was able to pull myself together and everything worked out fine. But, but yeah, that, that was a person that I should not have had in my early community. (laughs) (laughs) And you learn because we fail, right? You said it, you know, that's the best teacher, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, But allowing ourselves to know exactly, you know, what we need. And we, we determine that through that first year of teaching, especially. Uh Mm Uh-huh. And I, I was thinking if I could talk to my first year self, I would remind myself that student behaviors are not personal Mm -hmm. and that every behavior that a student exhibits is 
trying to meet their need because I didn't know that as a first year teacher. And I think had I known that, it would have helped me approach students differently than I did. Mm, I love that. So yeah, as you all are trying to build your professional needs and find your community, you can watch out for this session and many more by visiting the 2024 FMEA Professional Development Conference. It is happening this year on January 10th through January 13th at the Tampa Convention Center. And you can visit FMEA.org for more information. We hope to see you all there. Thank you. Thank you.